I doubt there is a word in the English language which, when it is used, is as abused as much as the word love. One hears it banded around in every cadence from television and film screens and on the radio. Newspapers and magazines and popular songs have it as their constant theme. It is natural, of course, that love should be the subject of a nation's poetry and song. But so often in modern times, the word love is misused for sentimentality, sensuality and lust. Love cannot be defined. It is so bound up with the mystery of human personality. There is a complete emptiness in a life without love. Human happiness and strength of purpose depend upon it. Without it, life is no more substantial than a bubble blown away in the wind. The verse we have just heard from the Gospel according to John is probably the most recognisable verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. But such as the word love is misused or misunderstood, what does this verse of scripture actually mean? We go back to that fundamental word, love. Lovelessness results in self-disintegration. It manifests itself in conflict and frustration. Where there is love, there is unity and self-giving. Love is a mystery because God is a mystery. For the mystery of love is simply the mystery of God. God is love, says St John. And St Paul says that no one can penetrate the depths and height and length and breadth of love which is divine. The word itself was born in love, and every human being made from love to love. There is a communion between the divine and the human, for all love results in communion, a commingling of personalities, a fusion of spirits. God communes with us through Christ. St Paul tells us of this in effect when he says that through the love of Christ we will be filled with the fullness of God. Thus all human love should be integrated into a shared love of God in Christ. This love means the destruction of egoism, for false love, or the opposite of love, is the idolatry of self. True love strips itself for another. Even God made himself poor and needy and gave his life for those he loved. For love is often born of a mixture of joy and pain. The passion of Christ exemplifies this. Human love may have its dawn in ecstasy, but the real depth of the love is only attained after trials and pitfalls and persecutions on the way. For where there is love, there is a striving after unity, and perfect unity is not gained without struggle and hurt. Sometimes people ask the question, why did Christ die on a cross? Was it necessary in order to save us from ourselves? It certainly was not necessary. He need not have died at all. We could have been saved in many ways. God could, for example, simply have willed our salvation. Why didn't he? Here we come up against the sublime mystery of love. All love has a mysterious element to it, but God is love itself, and hence is the mystery of mysteries. Love is the key to the whole work of redemption, and love is the reason why suffering and death were involved. Christ said, greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Suffering and dying for others is indeed a supreme sacrifice of love. And since God so loved the world, he decided to win the world back to himself through the sufferings and death of his only son. Love died on the cross in order that love might be reborn in us. And the very amount of suffering this involved was purely and simply the overflowing of love. When the devil came for the soul of Faustus in Marlowe's play, The Tragic History of the Life and Death of Dr. Faustus, he cries out, See how Christ's blood streams in the firmament. One drop would save my soul. 
half a drop are my Christ. And yet it was not one drop or even half a blood of half a drop of blood which was spilt. It was every single drop. Thus God's love was superabundant. Like human love, the divine delights in union, in the sharing of life. And part of this mystery of redemption is this delight of God in coming down to our level and sharing human life. God became a member of the human community, a part of the human race. He took his place at the head, becoming its representative, so that he could, in its name, make restitution for wrongs committed. All of us hung on the cross with Christ. We all died with him in order that we might rise with him to a new life. In this way, perfect reparation was made to God. The complete restoration of the balance of justice was brought about. Because of his love, he wanted it this way. Humanity had destroyed the beauty of God's creation by sin. God became a man to restore this beauty by giving life through death on a cross. Our meditation, then, should be on the immense love of God, as it is through this love, as we read in Ephesians, that we have been saved by God's goodness and grace, his gift to us all. This love should fill us with amazement, and at the same time urge us to give a response of love. Christ told us that the greatest commandment is to love God above everything else. This love is not just a thrill in the nerves, a warming of the bloodstream, or a speeding up of heartbeats. It springs essentially from the mind and will. From the mind, since there can be no love without understanding. From the will, which must be set upon the object of love with complete constancy and steadfastness. There may indeed be a thrill, an upsurge of emotions in one's loving, but love is not true love if it does not persist when the fine feelings die down. There will soon be a documentary airing about the life of Caroline Flack, a TV personality who took her own life just over a year ago. Her death sparked a movement on social media, where everyone promoted the ideal that in a world where you can be anything, be kind. Whether you agree with somebody's viewpoint or not, be kind. Whether you find a person unpleasant or not, be kind. And yet that message only seemed to last as long as the current trend. The sentiment was quickly lost, and the world of social media once again became a toxic environment. Love cannot become a fleeting hashtag with no meaning behind it. Love should be permanent and at the heart of everything we do and say, remembering that we can only love because God loved us first. To love God above all things then means putting God first in our lives, having him constantly in mind and not allowing any human desire or ambition to come between ourselves and him. Love, therefore, is the duty of every Christian, for love is self-giving, and we are to lose our lives in order to gain them. Amen.